Well, I'm Dave Bushmeyer from Organization 2123, and I thought we put this class together primarily for the people that are, uh, have limited experience in semiconductors, particularly in semiconductors that are built in the outside industry, uh, the commercial industry, the, the biggies, TIs, Motorola's, Fairchild's, where we have to provide high rel weapons programs, devices, uh, within Sandia, but we have to buy them in the outside industry. I thought what we'd try to do is make it a general course that would talk about how devices work. We'll start out with simple devices, with uh, single junction devices, um, diodes, and we'll go into transistors and op amps, SCRs. We'll get into RF devices. We'll eventually get into monolithic ICs. We're we'll going to talk a little bit about special devices like optic devices. Uh, if you have any questions as we go along, uh, feel free to ask the questions. If we don't have the answers here, we'll bring them back through for the next class. Me too, why don't you sit around over there? We're just getting started, so we're not. Uh, and eventually, we are going to end up talking about the, the um, monolithic ICs, and then radiation damage to semiconductors. And finally, we're going to talk about the circuit design itself. Why does a person want to use a semiconductor? What does he think of, or what function does he want? Uh, it'll be one thing to ICs and know what they might do as a device, but it's, a, it's another field to talk about what the user might be looking for in those devices. Now, some of the material today is directed more toward the activity in product development of 2123. This will be the only class that will be that way. The rest of the class is going to be very general on semiconductors. But I think even the material I cover here will be uh, valuable or at least of some use to you people if you're going to be interfacing uh, in the future uh, with semiconductor vendors or trying to obtain semiconductors in high rail programs from the outside of Sandia. So I say that that's outside Sandia to differentiate it from the, the CRM, the uh, total custom built here at Sandia. It's a, it's a different operation. We have two divisions at Sandia that do product development. One of, them does them basic, one of them does the development basically for the CRM. The other one is my division, and we work with the outside customers. We also are bipolar in my division, but we'll be talking both about bipolar and MOS. Now, I've given you some handouts. Those handouts are mostly information sheets. They're just reference sheets that you might want to keep. They have uh, references to agencies. Uh, we'll be covering some of them in view graphs and also acronyms for devices uh, and, and what they mean in the way of accepting product. Let's talk a little bit about the, the class of devices that you can procure. There, there's no distinction uh, specifically, that no book that you can open up and say, here are the classes of devices. Everyone has their own definition of high-rel devices, uh, what a commercial device is, what an industrial device is, but basically they can be broken down into these divisions. Military parts, telecommunications, automotive, computer-based, and what we call jelly beans. Which of those do you think would be the least expensive? Yeah, the jelly beans. Which of these do you think are the easiest to get? The jelly beans. We cross all these borders when we buy parts, depending on what we need in a system at Sandia. We prefer to work up here in the military product. Telecommunications are the next most reliable parts. They're also the second most expensive parts. Automotive, believe it or not, are relatively reliable parts. There's a lot of testing done on them, a lot of life testing. There's two kinds of automotives. Automotive entertainment kinds of things for the radio, stereos in the car and then under the hood automotives, which uh, work with the ignition system and with the engine performance. Computer-based, that speaks for itself. That's the devices that are used in computers. And then the jelly beans are the nickel and dime, and I mean nickel and dime. Some of them are pennies that you can buy off the shelf or you can get out of stores. Those, at times, were, were faced with using parts that generically are from that type of device, and that were, that's where we get in the most trouble. You, you might ask why we would bother to do that, and I think you'll know by the time we finish. Incidentally, uh, who do you think is the biggest semiconductor supplier in the United States? I heard a lot of TIs. Any uh, Fairchilds? Motorola? Intel? National? 
Dennis, do you know who the biggest one is? Do you, Al? Probably IBM. IBM. They make all their own semiconductors. And in doing that, they become the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the United States. Probably one of the smallest as far as selling devices to other people. But they make all of their own. I think this is an interesting statistic. There are 20,000 military specifications in existence right now. 20% of them refer to hardware, and only 5 or less than 5% refer to electronics. If you ever get involved in procuring devices and having them tested to mill spec or accepted through quality assurance, you'll never believe there's less than 5% of them that are on electronics because it seems like there's a, a, a mill spec on every turn that you have to meet in order to meet devices. These are the real workhorses of the military specifications for devices, for the discrete devices and for the microcircuits. And by microcircuits, I mean monolithic, more than three leaded, uh, multiple function devices. So if you're working in transistors, diodes, you'll hear a lot about those parts. They're covered primarily in these specifications. Monolithic devices are covered primarily in the other specifications. Now, one of the handouts that you have or will get, I think I've already handed it out to you, talks about what 38510 is, what 883 is, and what, 19, uh, what uh, 9500 is. The, uh, the largest application we have at Sandia for the mill specs usually fall into this category, and particularly the 883. 883 is the test methods. It tells how the part must be tested in order for that part to be reliable. Well, we have military specifications, and that's for the military devices. That's the first category that we talked about this morning. What's the advantage of going to those military specifications? If we try to go to a mil spec device, these are the things we hope to gain. And incidentally, that is our first choice. If we're going to use a semiconductor device for a program, we'll hear from a user, somebody that has a programmer, a timer, a radar, they'll want a certain device to be used in that assembly. They'll want it to do a certain job. We try as, as fast as we can to locate something that is in the military specification area so that we have some background data on its reliability and on its life testing. If we can make use of the military device, one that's military approved, we can get it in reduced cost, it's interchangeable with other devices, it has government approved suppliers, and this is a, a big plus, and it's a very, very expensive and complicated procedure for a, a supplier to become a government approved for a device. Each device has been qualified as a result of being government approved has standard electrical testing procedures, and that gets back into that 883 test procedure that we talked about. Uh, industry accepted test methods, less specification writing, because most of the specifications are created for the military product. Less time lost in negotiating for specifications because they're already building it, they know what the device does, and they have a specification on it. And you would hope to get improved delivery since you have other customers that are using the same kind of device. Well, if we have those kind of advantages going to military specifications, then why would we do anything else? Well, it's like everything else. There's no free lunch. There's some disadvantages. With a military specification, we have no customer source inspection. Generally, you buy them. They send them out from the plant. There is a source inspection, but it's a government inspection, not our inspection to our requirements. Uh, changes on a large-scale basis. If the big user happens to be TRW or Lockheed, they may decide that they want a different distribution of devices. They want it to perform something else. It'll still be accepted to the same kind of test methods. It'll still have the same kind of quality, but it may change its specification. It may change a package dimension. It may change its electrical limits that it's tested to if the market changes. And we have, as a, as a small user, have very little control over that slow to address new technologies. One of the reasons it's slow to address new technologies is that in some cases it takes as much as four years to get a part qualified for a military application. And four years in the semiconductor industry just about removes you from the current technology. It's moving so quickly and changing so fast that you end up getting a device that, that is not current technology. Now that's not all bad. 
if, if you want a device that's going to work, it's going to be reliable, and you've got a lot of good back, know it's going to be available for the life of your program, then you're better off to use devices that have already been built or being built for some time. The problem is that after four years, you run into the, the situation, and we're running into that, I would say, once a month at Sandia. We get a call from the vendor, and they say, we're no longer building that product. We're discontinuing it. We're only going to have it for three more months or six more months. You'll have to find a new source. So when you start to get older devices, you may run out of their availability. Uh, no avail no uh, ability for selected electricals. As we said, the specification's written. It's all set. You have uh, very little to do with what you can change on the specification. Some devices include electrical deltas. Others do not. And there's a little note there that says S levels. One of your handouts will talk about B-class devices, S-class devices, and that's just the amount of testing that's done. The class S device is typically referred to as aerospace or high rail military device. If it's a class S, it has almost every testing that they know about that they can put in. There are relatively few class S devices compared to what's available in the industry. Uh, class B device is the next level down. That is much more common, much more available from vendors. It has considerable testing in it and high rail testing, particularly in terms of life test and burn in, but not as much as class S. No provision for com customer deviations in the event of lot failures. We can't, we can't do anything with a vendor. We buy it. If you buy a mill standard product, that's what you get, and you live with it. Uh, no data unless requested on the purchase order. No provision for Sandia dice lot certification. We'll talk a little bit about dice lot certification when we get into what we're doing at, at Sandia. Now, some of the people that are involved in mill standard, and we're not going to review these in any kind of depth, but I want to flash these on so that you can look at them. There are several pages here of agencies, and these are in your handout, and they're in more detail in your handout. They talk about what they are. But these are agencies that are involved, and it gives you some feel for the magnitude of the people that are buying mill standard product and why it's difficult to have much control on it. Uh, some of these that you'll, you'll see uh, BMO is one that interfaces with Sandy a lot. DARPA has large contracts. If you read any of the uh, uh, technical magazines or the semiconductor magazines, these agencies are being referred to. Now, these agencies all make use of mill standard kinds of product, some class S and some class B, but uh, primarily straight mill standard product. Let's see, ECOM is a big one that's used quite a bit. Uh, uh, here, now, here's a DESI is, is one that we're going to talk about a little later. DESI is the one that determines the specifications and does the policing on these specifications at the different vendors. There's another list. We're, we're just going alphabetical, and that's about the third page of people. NASA, JPL. We, uh, JPL is a customer of ours. We supply some parts from them from the CRM. Some of you that work for the CRM may be aware of that. JETIG is a civilian branch that does some of the specification controls and definitions. Incidentally, JETIG, uh, let me go back and, if you see that on a package or you see that in a definition, J-E-D-E-C, usually that's a uh, designation for a package description. It's a JETIG package. Things packaged are called TO18s, TO5s, uh, uh, all kinds of nomenclatures that re that describe the dimensions and the size and the lead configuration on packages. That's done by Je uh, JETIC. There's a, another list, and that just gives you some idea of the people that are involved in procuring mill standard product. Now, a lot of these people face the same problem that we face at Sandia. Semiconductor suppliers, it's not unusual for them to build 50 or 100,000 parts of a given type a month. That's, that's not a big order for them. Uh, what we use at Sandia in the programs, and this is across the board on all weapons programs, generally run oh, anywhere from 50 to 5,000 for a total program. Um, I mean 50 devices. We have customers coming to us at Sandia that want 50 devices that they're going to use over the next three or four years. Now, we've got to try to find something that's available, something that somebody already builds that we can use that we might spec. 
because we're not going to get anybody's attention in industry for 50 devices. Now, on the other end of the program requirements, the weapon may be 2,000, maybe 5,000, but that's over five years, sometime eight years. And to try to get their attention to do something special for those quantities is extremely difficult. So we try to avoid that. Being a good product uh, development engineer or a good semiconductor development engineer doesn't mean that you go out and develop new products every chance you get. As a matter of fact, it's almost the reverse. If you can convince a user, if you can work with a designer, and we do work very close with the designers, to try to convince them to mo modify their circuit if they need to, or change the function that they're trying to uh, perform in order to use something that's commercially available, we've done them a better service than we would have by going out and getting a custom device. Uh, and I say custom device not in terms of building it from scratch like we do here in the CRM, but some modification of, uh, of a device. Uh, a lot of people have this kind of attitude that can really get you in trouble. People think that if we're buying something special or if we're having something special built for Sandia, we're really going to have a good product and everything's going to go smooth. And as often as not, we've got more headaches than we would have if we had started with something that was already built. Uh, we have several transistors. 2N22, 2N2907, how long has that been around, uh, Al? Since I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at least two years. Uh, <laughs> No, it's been around literally for years in the industry, and there's no indication that they're going to be discontinued. They're, they're workhorses. They're kinds of devices that, that uh, everybody uses. They perform basic functions. They'll probably be around, and if we can use them, we'd be better off any day than trying to develop any special device. Uh, yeah. The one came memory was mill qualified after the last manufacturer quit building. Yeah, that's... Now, that's the kind of thing that can happen because we, you can run into over four years or up to four years in getting a device qualified at a vendor. Uh, we've recently worked with people, uh, Intel, went to Intel and talked with them about building a monolithic device for a Sandia High Rail program. Now, it basically was a device they were building, except we wanted to test it differently. We wanted different burn-ins, different life tests, different electrical parameters, but it was a device they were building. We wanted to provide our high rail spec to build those parts. It took us the better part of a year to convince Intel to sell to us. We didn't even name the price. We just said, you tell us what you need for these parts and we want to buy them. And it took them a long time to decide whether they wanted to sell them at any price. Because these specifications and the Sandia kind of requirements become such a headache and become so burdening to the vendor. If he can sell 100,000 a month to somebody that's using video games or computers, if he can sell those at a dollar a piece, he'd much rather do that than sell our parts at four or five or six hundred a piece because of the small volume that we use. Uh, the RF devices in our division are much more expensive than the bipolar in general, but it's not unusual to have, what, a 400 or $500 device uh, in RF, but the quantities we're talking about are in the hundreds. So we just, we just have a difficult time trying to get anything different from the uh, from this vendor. Now here's a, a description of the military agencies that helped to develop the mill specs. Again, it's less than 5% of 20,000 specs that these people have worked on. But this is the one that you'll most often run into when, when you're talking about specifications and devices. DESI is, is the, uh, the way they pronounce the uh, acronym. They'll talk about DESI qualified line, uh, 38510 DESI qualified. There's a thing called QPL that stands for qualified products list. Yeah, that, if, if, you're, if the vendor gets his part on the QPL, that gets it qualified, that makes it available for people to buy. You know what level of device you're buying. So if you're trying to find devices for a high rail program, and remember something else that, that's true for almost all of Sandia requirements that's different than the industry. It sets us apart from most of the users in the industry. People are looking for devices that will work for 1,000 hours, 2,000 hours, uh, years, 20 years under power. They don't want that system to fail. In Sandia's application, we're usually looking for a device that'll work for 30 seconds after it sits on the shelf for 20 years. 
Now, that's a different kind of requirement. And strangely enough, you'd think that would be easier, but it's not always easier. We have a requirement right now in the division for a reference diode, a precision voltage reference diode. The vendor has a pretty good feel of what that device does under power. Put it on power, allow it to sit there and function, he knows what it'll do. If you go back to the vendor and you ask him what it will do if it sits on the shelf for 20 years and we put the power on for 30 seconds or one minute, is it going to be the same as it was 20 years ago? They don't know. And we're really not sure how to prove that. Some of our people, and John is one of them in our division, are trying to look at some testing that might verify that force and help us out. So our requirements are different. They're low volume, they're high rail for the most part, and they're used for a very, very short period of time, except they're kept in stores for a long period of time. Now that's the weapons application, so it's very different. There's one other aspect of this that's different that we need to talk about and you have to be aware of because it's one of the controlling factors of whether or not we can use a mill standard part. For the most part in the programs, we cannot use a mill standard right off the shelf. And the reason is that we need radiation. We need radiation capability on a device. It has to withstand a certain amount of radiation. It has to function under a radiation environment or it has to work after a radiation environment. In some applications, it may shut down or they may bypass it during the radiation and not use it in the circuit. But then after a certain period of time, it must come back up and be able to be used again in radiation. Now, very few of the industry manufacturers know anything about radiation of their devices, radiation capability of their devices. So what we have to do as part of the characterization at Sandia is look at that device under radiation conditions to determine how much it degrades. So that's one of our problems in using mill standard developed parts. Okay. Let me give you an example of some people that use non-mill standard parts and why they use non-mill standard parts. Collins Radio and General Dynamics, they require onshore fabrication of their devices, manufacturing and test. Now, 883 issue C, I think the latest 883 is now requiring onshore. I'm not sure about that. Do you know, Al? They, they just rewritten it, and I think the issue C of that may require that onshore fabrication. Uh, customer source inspection, which we mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, that we couldn't get with mill standard, JPL and Raytheon. Are, these are just examples. There are many more companies that use their own devices. Uh, use their own specification for devices. TRW Space Division, they need additional burn-in. Electrical deltas, by that we mean what it looks like before and after test. How much did it change during the test across burn-in? Lockheed needs that, Hughes needs that. As soon as you get to a specific requirement, if you remember one of the disadvantages of mill specs, you can't get in there and juggle with the figures and get the data and change the test data. You get a mill standard part, you get a mill standard part, that's it. It's like buying a piece of Samsonite luggage. It's, it's that. You can't modify it and have a handle put somewhere else, and then it's not Samsonite anywhere. So, anymore. So now that's the same thing we do with these devices. Selected electricals from Lockheed uh, Missile Division, TRW, Hughes, Delco. Limited usage <coughs> qualification for reduced sample sizes. And if you look at the bottom one, custom circuit requirements, radiation hardened insurance, and increased burning temperature, Sandia Labs. So I don't think in the weapons programs that we are using any uh, mill standard parts as such. What we buy them from the vendor is a mill standard. We test them. Uh, now, we have some programs that do not have the radiation requirements or do not have the long-term requirements. We have a program uh, of devices <coughs> called JTA, Joint Test Assembly. Those assemblies are used to test a weapon and they're used for a very short period of time, a few months, um, and they're used quickly. So they don't have the same kind of requirement. They also have no radiation requirement. So those, we might be able to use mill standard. We might be able to use less than mill standard. We might come down that scale to telecommunication parts or computer parts. Uh, why would we have to, why would we ever want to use jelly beans? If, if we know they're cheap and we know they're low reliability, why bother with them? 
because we have a user that comes up with a requirement that n nobody else meets. We have a little semiconductor supplier somewhere. He has a line built off somewhere, and he's got a special device that he builds. <clears throat> and he built it maybe for something he invented, some circuit that he was going to use it for. One of the systems people gets a hold of that device. It has a particular characteristic that works better than other devices. He designs it into his system. Perhaps by the time the semiconductor man gets around to it and looks at it, it's too late to redesign that system. He's got the capability to find it. He needs that part. That becomes one of the most challenging tasks you can have for semiconductors because now you've got to buy this part that you know is built with the intention of being inexpensive. They build at high volume. They pop them out on machines. They do very little testing on them. We've got to get to a vendor and convince him to do additional testing or perhaps even change some of his fabrication or build techniques in order to give us that high rail part because there's nothing else in the mill standard catalogs that will meet certain requirements that this man might have. So we try to stay away from that. In a lot of cases, we cannot get the vendor to do that, and we end up testing these at Bendix. How many people here are familiar with Bendix, Kansas City? You know that Bendix is our production. Yeah, Bendix is our production agency. We develop them here, define them, and Bendix procures them to be used in their systems. Well, Bendix has a quite an incoming ins inspection capability. And in some cases, we have Bendix do the testing on them if we can't have the vendor do the testing. The problem with that is that chances are if they fail at Bendix, we have to eat the devices. They're our responsibility. We have to go buy another lot of devices from the vendor because he's not responsible to meet those. Uh, I wanted to mention about the policing. Yeah, here it is. These agencies are the agencies that are responsible for reviewing the status at vendors. Uh, some of you may have read recently, I guess, I think Fairchild was the most recent uh, <coughs> company that had a problem with, uh, with DESI. But these people will go to the vendors and they will check on what the vendor's doing. Is he building the part the way he was qualified to build it? Is he doing all the burn-in? Is he recording the data that he's responsible for? And it's not unusual for them to find that the vendor is not doing that. He's what we call dry labbing the data. He'll just assume that the parts are going to be in a certain range and he'll say the parts shall be capable of or are capable of and he will not do specific testing on devices. So we, it's not infrequent that we find problems with uh, vendors as a result of these inspections when they police against the military specifications. Now, you, you're welcome to get a hold of 38.510 or 8.83 if you have any use for it. I think there's a copy available in 21.23. Some of you people may not have a, a need for it. But the two documents together, or uh, uh, 19.500, that view graph was wrong I had up there before, wasn't it? I had 9,500 on that. I believe it was 90, that's 19,500. I think there was a one left off that view graph. I'm not sure about that, I'll check it. But anyway, it is 19,500. Uh, those specifications are, are that thick. Page after, yeah, the, the, the summary of the specification is that thick. It's page after page of testing definitions. As Dennis said, he put his hands out like that. You can get, you could stack this whole floor with mill specs that, that apply to our devices. And the portions that we use of them are considerable. We use the burn-in areas quite a bit, uh, electrical <coughs> tolerances, the life testing, uh, all of those areas we refer to marking. Uh, it just goes on and on, package size, and we refer to military specifications. So we do make use of the military specifications. We try to take advantage of the product that's built to the military specification. But in general, we add our specification in there. We put our requirements in for what data we want, what sampling we need and lot sizes, quality levels. You'll notice that uh, one of the handouts has an acronym called an LTPD. That means lot, percent, lot tolerance percent defective. And that's usually what we base our procurement of devices on. That means that with so many samples that the vendor selects and he does the electrical testing, he's allowed so many failures, depending on the LTPD that we select. If he gets more failures than that, the lot is rejected. And our specification then will tell him what he can do. Some cases he can resample and test to the same LTPD, which is uh, not a good approach. Other, uh, other steps, he may have to screen the whole lot uh, for that failing parameter and resample again. Or he may have to pull additional samples and sample tighter to the next sampling plan. But these are things that are put in there primarily based on our reliability needs and our quality needs. We try to look to our reliability group, which is 7220, 
uh, to try to tell us what they think we ought to have in the way of sampling and what we do in the, re in the event that we get a failure. Okay. Let me just go through now and talk about the device types that we work with. And as I say, this is 2123, but I really believe it holds across the board for anybody dealing with, with semiconductors for Sandia programs. We deal with what I call commercial, and by that I mean something that's just off the shelf. We can use just what they have. All we do is spec it close enough to make sure it's meeting their requirements. Then the next step, if we can't find that, this would be our druthers, would be to find something that's commercially available. Now that could be a mill standard product and preferably should be a mill standard product, but it's commercially available in the industry. If we can't find that, then we go with that type of device with special Sandia testing. That will call out a certain percent of them. That may give us a certain skew or a certain uh, distribution of their data that we want to use in our application. The next step would be commercial device with vendor screening. We would get the vendor to do some testing. We don't like to depend too heavily on vendor testing, but we do in some cases. Um, custom commercial die down, that would be special die downs or special commercial devices that are put in special packages. They're, they're bonding in, uh, bonded in special packages, they might be special bonding. For instance, if we have radiation requirements, the vendor might use gold wire typically on his parts. Gold wire is a bad actor in radiation. Gold is a bad actor in radiation. So we wouldn't want gold. We might want that to go to aluminum. So we would have him do special bonding uh, in the package and use aluminum wire so we could use it in our radiation. Uh, the die down, they might use epoxy die down. We might have a temperature requirement. Some of these words may mean a lot, may not mean a lot to you right now, but I think as you go through the class, it'll mean more. But the die down is just the way in which the little silicon die is fastened down to the, uh, the header. And if they essentially glue it down with an organic glue, that may not be good enough for the temperatures we need. So we may have to have them go back and do what we call a eutectic die down, which means we have to have a metal kind of a connection on that, so it'll take a higher temperature. The next thing would be a custom die geometry and unique processing. We're into that on two or three in my group, and that essentially is CRM work. That would be what the CRM does. And it's one thing to do it in-house when you know your intent and you're set up for that kind of volume, but this is really a problem when you try to get the industry to do it for you. And we are having that done right now. We have some custom devices. We've had no choices in the matter. Uh, we can't find the function with what's available, and we've had to have a vendor build custom devices for us, and it's a problem. Then Sandia designed commercial build. And we're into that situation where we design it here we can't get other people to design it. There's no market for them. They don't want to put the time and money in it. We design it on our end, Sandia, and go out to the commercial industry and have them build it for us because we're not geared to build the volume or to build the processing that we might need, particularly something like gallium arsenide, which you'll hear something about in the second week. That's a, a different kind of material instead of silicon. Most devices these days are made out of silicon, the majority in the industry. However, it's shifting over to gallium arsenide. Uh, <coughs> and then commercial devices, Sandy and Bendix assembled. In some cases, we cannot get the devices in the configuration that we want them. We can't get the vendor to even put them in that kind of a package. Uh, for example, again, I said gold is a bad actor in radiation. Many of the packages that devices come in have gold, leads on, gold lids on them, gold-plated lids, and that'll cause us problems. The vendor will not go along with modifying that. So we bring the devices in, we put them together, and we put a ceramic lid on to keep from having trouble in radiation. And this is just a quick look at uh, the customers that we deal with at Sandia. Some of them will mean, mean something to you and some of them may not. Uh, I think this was one of the ones on the acronym. eg g was on there. Spartan Southwest is in Albuquerque. Honeywell all over. Raymond Engineering. Now, Bendix, General Electric, and Livermore are all integrated contractors that we work with on a regular basis for program requirements and delivering the parts. This is the kind of a sample of the number of vendors that we deal with. You'll see a lot of names on there that are familiar. TI, which most of the people named as the biggest supplier, is on there. Motorola, Fairchild. There's a lot of names on there I'm sure you haven't heard of. And that's, not, that's by far not all the companies. As a matter of fact, 
Interfet is not on there, which is a new one we just came across the other day. And that company really helped us out, as a matter of fact. All these companies that are in existence, we had some parts from Siliconics, wasn't it, Don? Some JFETs from Siliconics, and you're going to learn about JFETs, and they failed in our radiation. When we took them apart and looked at them, we found a good reason why they may have failed in radiation. In the meantime, somebody had come into Sandia and talked with Don Hoke, a company called Interfet from Garland, Texas, very small, new company. Turns out they're building a JFET. That JFET has the kind of processing, has the kind of protection that we needed, and it looks like we're going to be using their devices. But that's part of product development. That's the kind of things that we do to try to help next assembly users and get them the parts they need for their, for their assembly. Okay, let's talk about the activities in 21-23. And as I said earlier, this, this one class is directed a little more toward our activities in our group, and it's for the benefit of the people in the group. But it does apply, I think, to, uh, to most of the activities in the summer. <coughs> We've got to determine the source for these devices. Once people tell us what they want, we've got to find out whether anybody builds it, whether they build it in the quantity and quality we need. We have to worry about it, whether it can be procured in time. We have to worry about circuit compatibility. This becomes a very, very important factor. And this usually is determined by sitting down with the user and talking with him, finding out what he needs, how he's going to use it. He may have selected a part and put in a breadboard, and it works just fine. But he hasn't taken into account that he's got temperature or radiation or long-term power or heat <coughs> dissipation. None of those things may have been in that breadboard consideration because it won't be the same configuration. So one of the things we do is try to make sure that he's using something that's going to work in his circuit when he finally gets it in, in the uh, WR form, War Reserve, WR. Uh, product definition. We've got to make sure that we're calling out what we need and what he needs in the assembly. Characterization, we've got to test it. And I want to show you some examples of what happens if you don't look at things close enough or you don't test them properly. Failure analysis, status reporting, wafer lot certification. Suppose that we need a device to work in a radiation condition. We look at it and it's marginal. That lot just passed. How do we know the next lot's going to pass? It's a destructive test. We can't test them all first because we destroyed them to use them. So what we do is the thing called dice lot certification or wafer lot certification. And this takes cooperation of the vendor. What he does is build the device, the basic unit up, the chip, and he packages a part of those from that lot and he sends them into us. We take that and radiate them and look at them electrically. If they pass, we call that vendor back. We say, your, pass, your part's passed from that lot. Go ahead and package that lot and send it in. We'll use it. And every lot he submits, we do that same thing. Now, there are some ways to avoid that. If we happen to have a device that we look at in radiation and we're 100%, 200% better than what we need, then we think, if we keep his electrical parameters in the same ballpark as this lot, the devices are probably going to pass. We won't have to do that dice lot certification. And we have a group that is going to tell us now, 2155, or the Radiation Assurance Group, they will tell us whether we have enough margin in there or whether we have to do dice lot certification. Now, the, there's another approach, and that is that if we look at these devices in radiation, we find that there's some electrical parameter that if it's below a certain level, and we put those devices in radiation, they tend to feel in radiation. Then we'll add that electrical test to the specification. And we'll put it have, it'll have nothing to do, possibly, with its application. It won't be a circuit requirement. It'll be what we call a quality index test or a quality indicator test. And we'll look at that parameter. And if it stays within range of that parameter, we've got history on it that says it'll do, it'll do well in radiation. We're all right. We don't have to look at every lot in radiation. So there's three approaches we can take on that. But radiation is the one thing that really causes us some problems and keeps us from using standard commercial parts, the radiation conditions that these have to survive in. And I just want to summarize a little bit about the kind of approaches we should take. And that is that we should use mill standard where possible. So anytime you have a choice or you can help somebody out with devices or you're trying to provide them a device, look for something that's available in a mill standard that's either QPL certified or released, uh, I mean, uh, approved with a vendor. Uh, then we should specific devices for specific sockets. Make sure that we've got the right device for that application. Just because we have a device qualified, 
and at Sandia we call them SAs. Because we have that thing qualified and we call it an SA, that does mean that it's reliable and it means that it's high quality and it's tested. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right device for that socket. So if we've qualified it for a certain program and somebody else comes along and says, hey, you have an SA there, I'll use it in my application. You better sit down and think a little bit about whether he's using it in the right application or whether that's the right socket. He may not need that device. He might need something better, maybe just different. Customize only where necessary because that, is, that just takes tremendous amount of manpower and a, and a lot of overhead and a lot of headaches to try to customize something if you don't need to. Address the quality and reliability requirements of the system and also what the vendor does for the device and maintain product characterization. Let me just show you a flow chart, and we won't spend a lot of time on it, but I want to give you some appreciation for the time it takes to get a job done. This is a flow chart of the activity from the day the, vent, the user comes to the semiconductor man and tells him that he needs a device till the day it's up at Bendix in stores where they can pull it out and put it in a socket and use it as a WR device. So the first activity takes six to 12 weeks and includes those kinds of activities, and I've got the number of weeks that we're estimating in here for each one. So we've got about 12 weeks finished by the time we've decided quantities, budgets, schedules, mostly administrative things there except applications that we're talking about. We come over here, and now we've got the source determination activity. That's another four to eight weeks. Now we're up to 20 weeks. Come down here, we've got development sample evaluation. These number of weeks for these. Now we're 48 to 52 weeks. We're up to a total of 62 weeks. We're over a year. Product characterization, all of these activities, 8 to 12 weeks. Now we're 70 weeks. Now when we're finished, we turn it over to Bendix. Bendix takes 50 to 62 weeks in order to do their routine to get parts. And we're looking at 114 to 126 weeks to get something in stores. So when a user comes to, to us or comes to the semiconductor man and said, I need a part in a year, that should be plenty of time for you. He's already a year late. He can't get it. And that's one of the things we spend a lot of time doing right now is working with these people, trying to find out when they need the parts and what they really need to see if they can use something we already have. Because generally, we don't have the leisure of having uh, uh, more than two years in order to get the part developed. OK, one of the things I'd like to do is is pass out these books as a textbook for this class. And as I say, they're, they're really a commercial catalog type of a thing. But we'll look at, through a couple of sections of them here. I think it's ideal. I went through it last week, and I couldn't believe how much it pertains to the things we do here. Are we going to have enough? I think we should. This is put out by National. They had a, an earlier version that was quite good. Now, in the front end of it, some of you from, from the organization that you named, and by the, incidentally, before you leave, will you sign in your organization name? From your organization that you named, I think some of you are working in process and some in design. So the chapter one of this book is reliability in the die, and it goes through considerable detail on what makes a good design, the metallization pattern, uh, gold backing, Chapter 2 gets to reliability and in internal construction. That's also a CRM concern, but it's also a concern of, of Sandy in general, even if we're buying from outside. It explains what a die shear test is, a uh, wire bond pull test, what the, uh, I think the pin test is described. <coughs> Excuse me, pin is a particle impact noise detector test, where you, uh, what you do is shake a device and listen for the garbage inside the can. And, and it's a, a very sensitive, uh, system that listens for the smallest amount, and I don't, do you remember what the size of the device is, in, what the size of the contaminant? Okay, a half a mil device inside will rattle enough to make noise on the monitor, and it tells you that you've got contaminants. So that's covered. Then there's reliability of the finished package. And then, if you look at chapter four on page 22, there's mill standard 883. And you'll hear a lot of references if you're working with <coughs> semiconductors. <coughs> Somebody will say, um, oh, it's a mill standard 883 tested to uh, the 5000 series or the 5000 method. If you look on page 24, that describes what 5000 is and what the testing. And it goes into some detail. Look over on page 25, 
and it shows you. Now, you remember I mentioned class S, which was the aerospace quality? There's aerospace, there's class S, there's class B, and then class C. So as you get down class C and you go down below that, you're starting to head toward the jelly bean business. But the class S is the best you can get. That compares one to the other. It tells you what the device sees, what it's required to see in order to be uh, to sold to that class. Then I think the next chapter is uh, 883, no, 38510 program. So that talks about all the monolithic controls and device, uh, device testing that you have on uh, 38510. Then you got reliability of uh, VISIC devices. Uh, Radiation environment. It even talks in here about radiation environment, latch up, and how it affects parts. Reliability of discrete devices. And now you're back to the uh, mill standard 750, which is on discrete devices. Probably uh, 19500 is in here. And there's a section on reliability. And I wanted to particularly call on, OK, page 94. If you look at 94, there, there is the sampling plans that we were talking about, where you, so many accept, if you see the category there where it says accept and reject, AC and RC, that tells how, what you accept on and what you reject and your sample size is over on the left. That tells you the, the LTPD, the lot per tolerance percent effective of the device, depending on the sample size and the number you pass and fail. These will almost always be a part of the Sandia specifications. 100% Testing is never 100% effective, and you're always better off, even if you have a 100% screen, to follow up with some kind of a sample size to verify it was done properly. So that section is in there. Uh, reliability of commercial semiconductor devices. So it really covers uh, quite a bit of information and talks about processing, cost of devices, and I think it's something that you can get a lot out of. So. There's one on, there's a section on packaging. And then the back has a lot of terms and a lot of acronyms um, that descriptions of technologies, PMOS devices, CMOS, P-type material. Uh, after you've had some of these classes the next few days, this might make a lot more sense to you and you might want to go back through and look at some of these uh, definitions. But hang on to that and keep it. I think it's a good reference book, not so much as a textbook, but just a reference book to keep from, uh, from now on. And it's the kind of thing that probably won't get outdated significantly. It's, it, it's basic information that you can use. That was uh, provided by compliments of uh, Alliance Electronics. They gave us 25 copies of that so we could use those. Uh, do you have any other questions about where we're headed in the class? I think you'll find the rest of the class uh, very interesting and much more specific on kinds of devices and how those devices work. We hope we'll show you how they work and then end up with how they're damaged in radiation and then how they're used in the next assembly. Uh, it will be to your benefit to try to get to every class. Each class will stand on its own. We'll have uh, the classes videotaped so you can go back and look at them again if you need them. Some of the acronyms that, that you might hear around here. And during the week, if, you, if something comes up, ask, when they ask the instructor. If he doesn't know, he'll write it down, and he can get the answers for you. But uh, such things as uh, FPU. How many know what FPU is? OK, see, that's an acronym that you hear around Sandy a lot. FPU is a first production unit. Somebody will say, I, uh, my FPU is a year away. I need a device within one year because my FPU is a year away. Uh, or they'll come to you and they'll say, you're in bad trouble because you're, you're really hurting UU shipments. You know what UU is? Ultimate user. So if we're providing Trident two things to the Navy or something to the Air Force, that Navy or the Air Force, the submarine itself or the airplane, that's the ultimate user. And believe me, when you get a product that is starting to affect UU <laughs> shipments, you're in bad trouble. You get real popular then. You're, you're, right on the board uh, up front to define every day's activity. Uh, one last thing I'd like to, to show you, to give an example of the kind of things that can happen. Now, you're going to be learning a lot about devices, technical devices, uh, how they work, how the physics of the device works. Let me show you what can happen, though, that you have to look at these across the, across the board. We had some transistors that we had spec'd, electrical data. They all looked good. 
all of a sudden they started to fail. They were failing, uh, they were leaking. They were getting moisture in them. When we got to the parts, got two view graphs here, I'll show you. These posts go up through the top of a can on of a device, and then they're crimped off, they're sealed with a crimping tool. And if you look up here, you can see the difference between these three crimps and these, and these, this is a bigger version of it. It's kind of dark, but I think you can see it. And what had happened was the vendor had gone from this kind of a crimping tool to this kind of a crimping tool, and it did not seal that part off, and it was allowing moisture in that part. And that's a bad kind of a failure, because a lot of times those failures won't show up for a few months. They might be in assemblies. They might be used in next assemblies up at Bendix or in a system, and then they'll start to fail. So one of the things that is a very important part of characterization if you're working with devices is not only what they look like on a tester or a scope or the electrical parameters or when they run through their tape, computer tape testing, what do they look like? What do they really look like? What do they physically look like? So that when you first get a device and you define it and you characterize it and if, if you want to qualify it or release it for use, you should include physical descriptions of that device. So that if you're looking at future devices, for instance, if we had not looked at that or we didn't have the old samples and you only had that to go by, it looked fine. You wouldn't have found the difference. It might have taken a long time to find that difference. But when you look, you see there's a difference in the two of them. That kind of alerts you on what you should look for, for where the trouble might be. Here's a case where a vendor, I don't know if you can see very clearly or not, but that's the same die inside a package. It's too dark. I was going to ask you to tell me what the difference in those two are. Can, can anybody see what the difference in those two are? I think it's too dark to really see. But the significant difference is that the three wires that come from this chip here are bonded down to this gold substrate. And on this one, the vendor has elected to take that out and put it up on a post, up on top. Now, that could be a small change. It's an easy change to make. The vendor made it without any trouble at all. That could be insignificant, but it might not be. These are different. These are the same levels, essentially. This might be considerably higher. And when you start bending these wires and flexing them and getting relief in them to bring them up here to put them on the post, you might weaken them. They might fail with temperature cycle. This post is a different material texture, different top. It's, it has a different hardness than down here. All of those kind of things play a role into whether these things pass or fail. So it's not always the classic kind of uh, uh, electrical parameter that you run through a tester and you can determine on a tester. A lot of it takes a gut feel and a lot of it takes experience. Here's a, here's a little diode. I'll pass this around as a final example. But this is a diode that these two wires were together. That was a glass envelope. The way the thing is described to be built, the die inside the package is fused or welded, if you want to call it that, to the plug on each end. It's, it's a metallurgical part. Yet when they broke the glass, if you look over here, I'll draw a circle around it, it's so small you can't see it. If you look over on the other side, when we broke the glass, the little die fell out. It wasn't even, it wasn't even attached. It's something that we've just come across recently to be a major failure in one of our systems. Well, many of our systems, but one of our devices. We're going to go back through now and try to put a specification on this device that we do break some packages open. And we examine both ends of those to make sure that that little piece of silicon in there was welded. Because now, with temperature cycling, if it's not welded, it could open, could cause an open in the system. We had uh, that little a device just like that one, the same size, that cost $2.80 shut down five weapons programs and took about, I don't know, four or five months to try to get solved because the problem was that we had thousands of them in the field and thousands of them in next assemblies And you have to decide, are they bad enough that you take them out, you replace them, you scrap parts, you throw away $7 million worth of work. You do your homework right on these semiconductors and you can save the user a lot of money and a lot of trouble and you can meet schedules. If you just assume that if you can buy a mill standard product or somebody says it's good or Fairchild goes, builds a good product so we don't have to worry about it and you take their word for it, you're headed down the road for disaster on a lot of devices. So I hope that in the next few classes you'll learn about the physics of the devices and how they work and we'll have a wrap up that last day. One class will be two hours. That's next, uh, the week after next Thursday. I think it's two hours. But there's there's a lot you're going to learn just from experience of working with them. If you're working with semiconductors now and you're working with devices, you'll learn a lot from experience 
but you'll learn the physics in the next few weeks that, that at least tell you how they operate in a circuit, how they're supposed to operate. Any questions? Okay, I hope we'll see you uh, in all these classes. If uh, we've got a couple more chairs, so if other people were supposed to be coming and they want to come to the uh, remaining classes, why well, they're welcome to come in as much as we have space available. We'll meet here every day from 9. We've got the room from 9 till noon. The class formally will run till 10 or 10.30, and if you have any questions, why, feel free to ask the questions as you go along. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow.